A blessed evening to everyone. Good evening. Tonight, we will be talking about the second part of our series entitled Christmas Through the Centuries. Last Sunday, we looked at Christmas from the eyes of Moses. Remember when we discussed about the time when man sinned against God, that man fell short before God by disobeying Him. And in the midst of that catastrophic event that happened in the first three chapters of Genesis, there was a glimpse of hope, a ray of hope that was promised by God to Adam and Eve and to the rest of humanity. The mentioning of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, that in the days to come, there is going to be someone who will come as a victor against the enemy, against the devil that tempted Adam and Eve. So we talked about last week, um, from the lens of Moses, Christmas from the lens of Moses, there is going to be a person who's going to be a victor, Jesus, the victor over Satan. And tonight we'll be looking at Christmas from the eyes of Isaiah the prophet, okay? And we will be looking at the presence of God and how it affected so much the lives of the people back then in the context of Isaiah. From time to time, my wife and I engage into a discussion with our children. My little boy is just six years old, and my girl is ten. But there were really moments that we engage in a discussion with them because they make choices that are not inclined with our preferences. There are times they would say, we want to do this, and when as parents evaluate it, we would see that it's not really that good for them, and so we try to discuss with them about the matter. Like for example, there was one time that they wanted to wear a certain kind of clothes during the night. And when we evaluated it, the clothes that they wanted were very thin, and it was during a cold season. And plus the aircon, so we told them that you're going to suffer. It will be very cold in the middle of the night or maybe early dawn, it will be very cold for you if you will wear these dresses or these clothes. But they insist. You know, we discuss, we talk with them, we let them reason, and we listen to them, and we give our reasons as well. There were times that we really tried to stop them and really not let them do it. But there are times also when we evaluate the consequences of what they are about to do. If it's not so fatal, we would allow them so that they would learn the hard way. So one time they asked us, we want to wear this. And so we let them wear it. It was a cold season, and they wore thin clothes. We told them that if you will wear that, you'll get so cold later. But they insisted, so we allowed them. You know, sometimes in life, there are choices that we make that are actually not inclined with what God wants for us. And sometimes God gives options for us to choose the right thing, but there were many moments also that we chose the wrong thing. And there were times that God allows our choices to really be pushed through, that you and I would learn a lesson. Now, there was a similar situation to this in the Old Testament time when there was a king of the southern kingdom. His name was Ahaz, okay? Ahaz was in a very difficult situation because he needed to make a decision that's going to affect the entire kingdom that he was reigning over. And when he made the decisions, the text that we will be reading shows to us that his decisions were actually not inclined to the will of God. Will God abandon him? Will God leave him? We'll answer that question by looking at the passage in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. I'll read from the Nasbi 1995 edition. The word of the Lord says, Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have come in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest 
shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son Sir Jesub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, then, and say to Isaiah, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Razin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, As a sign for yourself from the Lord your God, make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. Let me just miss with you what happened during this time. Okay? During those days, Ahaz was the reigning king. Israel was in a condition of a divided kingdom. In the earlier part of the history of Israel, there was a united kingdom under the reign of King Saul, King David, King Solomon. After the reign of King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two. The northern kingdom that was composed of the nine tribes and some Levites that were assigned with them. The south was composed only of the tribes of Benjamin and Judah and some Levites who were with them. So the northern kingdom contained more people and more tribes than the south because for the south, there were only Benjamites and Judahites and a few Levites. Okay? So that's the condition. That time, the political condition in the Middle Eastern part of the world, in the ancient Near East, was very unstable. Everything was like a ticking bomb that when there is one nation that will commit a mistake, there is going to be a huge war that's going to happen. So that was the situation. Now, one of the most powerful nations back then was Assyria. Take note of the names of the places that I'll be mentioning. One of the most powerful nations back then was Assyria. Okay? The northern part of Israel or the northern kingdom and the kingdom or the nation of Syria, not Assyria, okay? Syria. They merged their forces and tried to assess if their armed forces were enough to fight against the Assyria. Okay, the, the nation of Assyria. The north of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the nation of Syria, they tried to ally with each other and form an army to fight against the Assyria. However, based on their assessment, their forces wasn't enough yet. So what they did was, they now went down to the southern kingdom, the kingdom, the nation that Ahaz was ruling. The king of Syria and the king of the northern kingdom went to Ahaz and tried to convince him to ally with them so that their force will be enough to go against the Assyrians. Are you following me? Now, the problem is this. 
Ahaz refused the offer. The king of the north, northern kingdom, and the king of Syria offered him an alliance to fight against the Assyrians. But Ahaz said, I will not join you. He refused the offer of these two kings because he had a secret alliance with the king of Assyria. That was the political condition. So, by the time he gave his, he, by the time he turned down the offer of the northern kingdom and Syria, these two countries became so mad of him and the southern kingdom. So they decided to invade Jerusalem, the south. But they couldn't make it. So they camp and camp near it and planned and strategized further how to destroy the southern kingdom. You don't like to join us? Then that's a declaration that you are our enemy. So they decided to encamp near the south and they strategized how to attack it and destroy the city. While they were encamped in Ephraim, they were there planning. The report arrived or reached to the king's palace. When Ahaz heard about this, he became so afraid. The text tells us that Ahaz was so frightened that his heart was shaking, so as the hearts of the people within his constituents. They were so much scared of what is happening. This was the time when God said to Isaiah, Isaiah, I want you to go to Ahaz. I want you to talk to him. Okay? Now, God is intervening to the situation by sending prophet Isaiah to talk with Ahaz and try to convince him. What is it that God wanted to convince Ahaz to do? Now, let's find out what happened here in their conversation. While Ahaz's heart was shaking and the people of, Israel, of the southern kingdom were shaking, the prophet Isaiah came to them to the picture and tried to give to them the very word of the Lord. God tried to convince Ahaz to shift his trust from the king of the Assyrians to him. And how did God do it? I discovered this if you look at verse 4. God tried to convince Ahaz by telling him, Ahaz, you stay calm. Stay calm. Maybe because God knows that when a person is not calm, you don't make right decisions oftentimes. When there is a problem happening, when there is a tension taking place, when there is a pressure being pressed on you, placed upon your shoulders, the possibility is we don't think well and make good decisions. So God wanted Ahaz to stay calm and to not be afraid. That was the advice of God. God stated further some lines that would ease the heart of Ahaz. God said to him, don't be afraid of these two nations that is raging against you, that are raging against you. What are those nations? Syria and the northern kingdom. Don't be scared of them. In fact, God said, these are, these are like two smoldering stubs of fire brands to me. Pwede ni sila isugnod from the perspective of God. They are nothing if you just trust me, if you just rely on me, if you stay calm and not be frightened because you trust your God. I can actually fight for you. I can actually destroy them for you. Simple as that. You just trust me. But Ahaz did not trust God that much that time. Why did I say that? Maybe because he was holding on to the secret alliance that he had with the king of Assyria. Probably he was expecting that the Assyrian king would come and help him against these two nations that were raging against him. So I think as I was thinking about this, this is really speaking a lot about human tendency that we easily trust on something that is tangible and visible. It's hard to trust God oftentimes because we cannot see Him and we cannot touch Him. Remember I told you before about a little boy? When God told him, boy, uh, when, when his mom told him, boy, you go to the kitchen and get the knife because I'm about to slice something. And the boy started walking when he saw the kitchen so dark. He went back to his mom and said, mom, 
I'm scared. It's dark in the kitchen. And then the mom said, don't be scared, my little boy. Jesus is with you. When the boy heard it, it glowed his face. And then he looked at his mom again and said, can you please tell Jesus to go the knife for me? He's scared. Why? Even if his mom told him Jesus is with you, it's intangible. He cannot see it. Human as we are, it's so easy to rely on our bank accounts. It's so easy to rely on our wealth. It's so easy to rely on someone that God sends to our lives in the form of a friend, a body, somebody who's there that we can touch, that we can hug, that we can talk with, and the person would respond to us audibly. It's so easy to trust in a matter like that. But it's hard to trust someone invisible and intangible. And probably this was, these were one of the reasons why Ahaz find it so hard to trust the Lord. So God tried to convince him, don't worry about it. Stay calm. Don't be afraid. I am going. I can actually fight for you. These are just like two smoldering stubs of firebrands before me. I can destroy these two nations for you. But he refused. Well, after, his, after he refused the offer of God, will God abandon him? Will God leave Ahaz? Well, based on the text, God did not. God tried to convince him further. What happened next, if you look at verse five, verses 5 to 9, this is what you will find out. God tried to convince Ahaz by assuring him that the plans of these two nations that were encamped there near the south already will not prosper. The God who sees what's going to happen next. Human beings like you and me, we are very limited in the way we see things. We can say a probability that would happen tomorrow. The CMT is planning to go somewhere tomorrow for a, for a meeting and planning and fellowship. We can plan about what's going to happen tomorrow, but we actually are not so sure if it's going to happen. Okay? We plan, but we're not sure if it's going to happen. But as far as God is concerned, He sees the future. So He told Ahaz, actually Ahaz, when I look at the future... These two nations that are raging against you, they will never prosper. You trust me. I have seen it already. While it hasn't happened yet, I have seen it already. I know it already. They're not going to prosper. In fact, in the years to come, the northern kingdom will disappear. God told him that they will never become a people anymore because they will be dispersed. Years later, God used the Assyrians to invade the north and uprooted them and distributed them to the different places of the world. That is why today, the northern kingdom is still missing. They are called the lost tribes of Israel until today. What God says, it happens. So that's exactly what God said to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah, just to convince him to trust him. But Ahaz trusted the ally that he had with the Assyrian king. So he remained scared, afraid about what is going to happen. Did God give up on him? Did God abandon him already after the second refusal? No. God continued attempting to convince him. What happened next, if you look at verses 13 to, uh, 10 to 13, God again spoke to Ahaz through Isaiah. And God told him, Ahaz, I want you to ask signs from me. What's the use of a sign? When a person is called by God and a person is quite confused about the matter, usually in the Old Testament times, they would ask for a sign from God to confirm about the calling, to confirm about God's intention. Remember, we talked about Gideon a few Sundays ago. When God called Gideon and said to him, you va va valiant warrior, you are going to be a judge over Israel, and I'm going to use you to deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. That was, that, those were the words of God to Gideon. And Gideon was confused about it, and he said, I'm actually not sure about what's going to happen, Lord. May I ask for a sign? And he asked for signs just for God to prove to him that what he's saying is really true, that he is the God who is worshipped by the Israelites. This time, Ahaz did not ask for a sign. It was God who told him, ask for a sign, any sign 
that you may think. Make it big. I want you to think of a sign that is really impossible for men, and I'm going to make it happen for you so that you will believe me, so that you will trust me. So he was the one who was telling Ahaz now, ask for a sign. Just say it. I'm going to give it to you. Imagine after the second refusal by Ahaz, God continued to co trying to convince him about shifting his trust from the Assyrian king to him. But what happened here, if you look at these verses that we are considering right now, is that Ahaz said, I would not put the Lord to the test. Ahaz may have sounded so theological and godly this time, but in the context, it was actually a refusal of what God was offering to him. Because God was telling him, ask for a sign and I'm going to show it so that I will be able to convince you or prove to you about what I'm, going, uh, what, what I'm going to do to you. But he refused. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So what happened next is that after he refused the offer of God for the third time, will God abandon him? Will God leave Ahaz? Will God dishonor? Uh, will God, I mean, leave his children, the southern kingdom already? Well, if you look at the passage, God gave a sign. God said, Ahaz, I am giving you now the prerogative to ask for a sign. But you are not doing it. But despite your refusal, I am going to give you a sign. What is that sign? If you look at verse 14 of chapter 7, Isaiah prophesied about the coming of a son that will be born out of a virgin. And that son will be named Emmanuel. Okay? It was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 that one day a son will be born from a virgin and that boy will be named Emmanuel. Well, in dealing with prophetic utterances of the prophets, there can be an immediate fulfillment of it and the final fulfillment of it. An immediate fulfillment, probably this happened with the son of Isaiah named Maharshal al-Hazbash, but we're not so sure about it because Isaiah never called his son Emmanuel. But one thing we're so sure, hundreds of years later, we look back about more than 2,000 years in our past, we see that a babe was born in a manger, and the angel told Mary and Joseph, you got to name him Jesus for he's going to save the world. He's going to be called Emmanuel. What's the significance of that name? What's the meaning of Emmanuel? Emmanuel is familiar to many of us, especially during Christmas season. Emmanuel means God with us. What's the significance of the word Emmanuel now to the context of Ahaz? That Ahaz was given by God the prerogative of choice to choose the right decision. What's that decision that God was leading Ahaz to do? To make a decision to trust God, the king of heaven, rather than trusting his secret alliance with the king of Assyria. God wanted him to make a decision that instead of relying so much on what is tangible and visible, he'll begin to rely on God's power to protect him, to care for him, to preserve his people. But he refused. Ahaz made a choice. I told you last week that God has given us the prerogative of choice, but we are never given the power to determine the consequence of our choices. I'll repeat. God has given us the prerogative of choice. You are free to make your choice. You can choose. You have that freedom. However, we do not have the power to determine the kind of consequence that we would have. Every choice we make has a corresponding consequence. For example, somebody hurt me. I have two choices. I will just brush it off, leave the person, or I'm going to revenge, take revenge. If I make a decision to take revenge and I happen to kill the person, now I am bound to the consequence of that mistake that I have made. Following me? I may have, there, there may be different consequences. I may be 
I may be, what is this, disturbed by my conscience because I have taken a life, or I might be running away because the policemen are chasing me. The law will be after me. Did I determine that consequence? No. It's there. It's set already. Once you do something, there is a corresponding consequence to it. Ahaz made a choice. His choice was that I would trust more my secret alliance with the king of the Assyrians. And that choice he made has a corresponding consequence. Now, what's the consequence of it? You look at chapter 7, verse 17 onwards. Later, the Assyrians betrayed him. The people whom Ahaz really trusted, they were the ones who betrayed him and they invaded some parts of the southern kingdom and initially destroyed some parts of the southern kingdom. It's painful for Ahaz this time. But he made a choice and he cannot escape the consequence of the choice he made. The name of Emmanuel the promised boy that would be born out of a virgin is so significant for the people of God this time. Why? It's a reality that the choice, the wrong choice of their king will bring them to their suffering as a consequence of that wrong choice. And yet God reminded them that even if a person is suffering in the midst of the consequence of that wrong choice made in the past, he will never live his children. I'll repeat. It's a reality that every choice we make has a corresponding consequence. The Israelites would truly experience the consequence of the wrong choice of their king. It's going to be painful. It's going to be filled with horror. But reality, God reminded them that even if you are going through the consequences of the wrong choice of your king, I will make it sure that I will remain by your side. My friends, it's God's presence giving them the assurance and comfort in the midst of pain. One time I attended a funeral service and there was someone who gave a eulogy. And in the speech of the person, he said to the dead one, Angkol, kabaloko nga naan na yud ka sa langit karon, kabaloko nga imog yud ming bantayan, o imuming uban-ubanan, bisag asami, kabalo mikol nga imuming proteksyonan. That's actually not biblical. A dead person can never protect you. A dead person will not be with you. Isa may ganahan anang uban-ubanan o multo. That's not biblical. What is biblical is a dead person will not be with you but the God who created that person and who made you and who has been with you from the very beginning is the one who will stay by your side. Even if we are suffering because of a consequence of the mistake of choice that we have made in the past, God's reassuring presence is given to Ahaz and his children. That's the assurance that God gave to Ahaz. God's comforting presence within our dreadful consequence. I don't know if some of us today are still suffering. And we don't exactly know what's the reason of the suffering that we are in. Maybe it's a product or consequence of the wrong choice we made in the past. You know, the consequences will always be there. You may run away from it, but you can never escape from it. It will run and chase you. It will run after you. It will chase you. And reality is that it will catch you one day. And if it happens, we will suffer. But if you are a child of God, this is what he said to the southern kingdom. You may suffer the consequences of the wrong choice that your king made. But I'll tell you, in the midst of your pain, I will always be with you. We always make wrong choices, right? But when we suffer the consequence of our wrong choices, God will never leave you. When a ship is about to sink, the captain will announce abandon ship. 
But when a believer begins sinking because of the pain he goes through, God will never say that. God would say, I am here beside you. When the Israelites suffered the consequences from the eyes of Isaiah, he looks forward to what God prophesied, telling them that even in the midst of pain, Emmanuel, God is with us. As we celebrate the Christmas season, some of us may be suffering about something as a consequence of our mistake. But always remember Emmanuel. He's the boy that was born in a manger more than 2,000 years ago. And his name will resonate in our hearts and minds, telling us God is always by our side. With that, take heart, press on, move on, and give all the glory to the God who's with you. God bless you all and good evening.